all you ask to say a few words about that silicon memory. And so I'll try and do that. And I suppose the, the whole point of trying to think about silicate weathering or why many people have been interested in it for several decades, probably four decades or more, is that it provides, potentially provides a, a, a mechanism of stabilizing climate, uh, at least on Earth. And so I suppose one of the first things I want to try and do is, is review evidence for what is a stable climate on Earth, why do we know, um, how convincing is that? Then I want to sort of talk through what the silicate weathering feedback is and, and really what controls it or what we think controls it, what the canonical view of, of what we think the controls are and what the sort of emergent view of what the controls might be. And then uh, and I suppose that, it's emergent, that emergent view is really thinking about a series of problems with it. Uh, and then I want to allude to a possible solution that's been lingering uh, sort of under our noses all along. Really. And so the fundamental issue that we are trying to contend with on our planet and presumably on other planets is that there is a continuous degassing on the planet from the solid earth. This is uh, a volcano that is degassing uh, large amounts of various gases, amongst which one of the important ones is carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, of course. That uh, gas is continually accumulating in the atmosphere, and if it, or if it was continually accumulating in the atmosphere, we would end up with a, a climate or a planet that looks more like Venus, more like this. We would have a runaway greenhouse. So something must be acting to remove that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or those greenhouse gases, not necessarily just carbon dioxide. Something must be acting to remove those. The question is what and how does that work? And you know, our planet, and possibly other planets, have got an interesting early history. This is you know, an artist's impression of the moon forming uh, impact very early on in the Earth's history, certainly within the first uh, 100 million years, within the first few tens of million years. It's got one of the interesting consequences that presumably what this did is it drove a lot of volatiles towards the surface of the Earth or even into the atmosphere themselves. If the, the atmosphere was able to be retained at that early stage in, uh, in Earth's history, and it's possibly, I've certainly been arguing, that this moving forward impact set the stage for what became a planetary atmosphere and what became ultimately a, what we think is a, is a feedback over time. And what this feedback, what this climatic control is thought to have done in the broadest sense is to maintain liquid water at the surface of the Earth over pretty much the entirety of its planetary history. So when we talk about climate feedbacks, it's not necessarily obvious without going into an enormous amount of gory detail, which I will allude to briefly, as to how stable the climate has been. But in the very broadest sense, one of the things that we know is that the Earth hasn't been a ball of ice throughout its entire history, and we know that we've had liquid water throughout much of Earth's history, so we must have been lower than 100 degrees Celsius. So we can put a very broad brush bracket on our planetary temperature. And some of that evidence comes from uh, rock outcrops, rock outcrops such as this one. This is one of the oldest uh, outcrops on our planet. It's 3.7 billion years old. And the key thing about these, uh, uh, this sedimentary rock, there is a, a geologist's hammer down in the scale, which is going to be of the order of 30 centimeters in size. And the key thing you can see in this image are rounded clusts. This is full of rounded sedimentary grains. Everything is rounded. Must have formed in liquid water. It's the only way we can really form clasts that big is in liquid water in an environment possibly similar to this river, which is from the modern day Himalaya. We must have had liquid water 3.7 billion years ago on the planet. We fast forward to uh, 3.2 billion years ago. So if we fast forward by 500 million years, Remembering that the geological record is relatively sparse back in early Earth's history, we haven't got a huge amount of time to be able to fall on. Similar sedimentary structures are sort of present. And in this case, uh, what we're looking at, or what is inferred to be here, is uh, something known as a cross bedding, which where sort of sedimentary beds are cutting one another in the most simplistic way. Uh, and these may well have formed in an environment that is rather similar to this modern fluvial sediment, where 
I don't know if this comes up on the photograph, but what we're looking at here is a series of sedimentary beds, uh, which are cross-cutting other beds. And I don't know if that comes out on screen or not. I obviously took a photograph, so I'm a biased eye when I look at it. <laughs> but to someone who's trained in sedimentology, this is just their bread and butter. They recognize this immediately as having formed in water. There is no other way that this that this could have been done. And those are really our only two key points back in earlier history, 3.2 billion years and 3.7 billion years old in terms of seeing something physically where we can pin down uh, a, a sort of a range of climate in terms of habitability where there's liquid water. These kind of things are not only seen on Earth, they're seen on, on Mars and probably on other planets. Um, there's some rather wonderful um, uh, uh, cross bedding that is seen on this photograph uh, from uh, this is from the Victoria crater of Mars. It's this region uh, here. It's a wonderful cross bedding. Don't be fooled by that cross bedding. That cross bedding is thought to have been formed by wind blow uh, activities. This is the, these are effectively dunes which are blowing sedimentary grains. But the bit that's interesting from my point of view is this bit uh, right on top up uh, here, which is uh, a leach zone, which has been. Um, I suppose imaged chemically by the various instruments that were, that were present on this uh, on this particular rover, and I think it's uh, associated with the depletion in chlorine or chloride at the moment uh, that is the case here, and that's thought to be associated with a dis set of dissolution reactions. Uh, in other words, what chemical weathering is something which I'll talk about in much more detail later. But for dissolution to occur, we must have water. Uh, and that's relatively early on in Mars, in, in Mars history. And it's very similar, that dissolution horizon that we see on Mars is very similar to my title slide, which I didn't say anything about when I put the title up. But this is a sequence of basalts, horizontally lined basalts, so were an igneous rock that has erupted from uh, a series of beds uh, in, uh, in the USA. These are the Columbia River basalts, so flood basalts, flat like basalts. And on top of each of these basaltic horizons is a sort of a red zone or a soil zone that has developed on each of these basalt flows before a new layer of basalt, a new lava flow, has been deposited on top of the previous one. So you have a lava flow, that lava flow is exposed to the Earth's surface, exposed to the atmosphere, to rain, etc. It oxidizes, it starts to, be, to dissolve, you develop a leached profile, and then along comes a new lava flow on top of the previous one uh, and covers it up. And on top of the subsequent lava flows, if you went to Mercury, you would find other leached zones or ancient soils, is what these effectively are. So there's sort of physical evidence for water being present on Earth up to 3.7 billion years. If we want to go back further, it's a rather more complicated way to try and infer that there is water present. We have to use isotopes, in particular the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in specific minerals. The reason we have to use specific minerals is there are no rocks back from any earlier than 3.7 billion years ago. But there are individual mineral grains which have survived, so there are no rocks, but there are no minerals. It's a very specific type of mineral called zircon, a mineral that's very resistant to chemical dissolution, but physical to physical abrasion, uh, and it's also quite resistant to melting. It ends up in a, in a, in a, a cycle uh, where it, it gets incorporated into a mountain belt and, and metamorphosis. These are very resistant minerals. These particular minerals are from Pilgrim. In, uh, in Northern Australia. Uh, and then the most ancient minerals that, are, that exist on our planet, so they go back all the way to 4.4 billion years ago. So they are by far the oldest thing uh, we have on our planet. Uh, and the interesting thing about these minerals, yes, that's going to be something stupid. All you know is that old. So they are dated using uh, uranium uh, lead geochronology. So these Particular minerals happen to contain a lot of uranium in that. Um, and so they're actually very amenable to, to dating, which is really quite fortunate. So they can be dated well, but they can also have other isotopic compositions measured in them. In this case, um, oxygen isotopic 
compositions. And the thing that's interesting about oxygen isotopes, so oxygen is obviously present everywhere as, as gas uh, in our atmosphere, but probably more importantly in terms of the reservoir in water and in the silicate lattice of silicate minerals in terms of planetary reservoirs. Um, and these isotopes, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, is a very important tracer, amongst other things, of whether there's been an interaction with liquid water or not at the surface of the Earth. If there's been an interaction with liquid water, this notation called delta O18 tends to become increased in numbers. So, a limestone, for example, which is often liquid water, uh, don't worry about the scale on this diagram, aficionados of this. You'll be wondering what it means. Um, a limestone will tend to be uh, enriched in delta or a higher delta compared to say a mantle value because it has uh, interacted with liquid water. Now, to go back to these zircons, the interesting thing about these zircons is if a zircon has come from the mantle, it should have a very fixed composition. A zircon that has come from the mantle should have a composition within this range here. We're looking at time on the x axis. So this goes back to 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, these uh, old zircons that I'm interested in here come from this region. Uh, we're looking at Delo 18 on the y axis. And you can see that there are a number of data points on this diagram that do not fall within the mantle range. Right? These are not zircons which have come from the mantle or have come from an igneous rock or from a melt. They must. The only way you can explain the oxygen isotope composition is either it's been completely reset by some later process, and these are rather controversial zircons, or they must have interacted with liquid water at the surface of the Earth. And in fact, it's not the zircons themselves that would have interacted with liquid water, it is the material that those zircons crystallized from. So there must have been liquid water altering materials which subsequently melted and from that melt a zircon crystallized and recorded that presence of liquid water. Now the detail of that doesn't matter from our, for our purposes. What matters is that what we can pretty much say with a high degree of confidence is that our planet has been between zero degrees and 100 degrees for pretty much its entire history. One or two episodes where it may well have been completely frozen last for very long. So we've had liquid water, quite a narrow range in temperatures. And that's a very interesting thing that's led to a number of uh, interesting things over the past few decades. One of the major ones is something referred to as the faint young sun paradox, which is this idea that in the Earth's past, the sun was less bright than it is today. It's 30% less bright. And if we were to use a simple black body radiation calculation and some paradox, something like uh, like this, um, where there are two, well, there's a number of key terms in this equation, is the temperature that we're trying to calculate, there is the solar luminosity or the solar constant, S, and uh, there is the planetary radius, R, uh, there is the amount of uh, light which gets reflected with enough the solar radiation that gets reflected, A, this albedo term, there's the distance from the sun or stellar body that we're interested in, and uh, an Boltzmann constant, and most importantly, what we're worrying about here, this term epsilon in here, which is the incidence. And so what you can do with an equation like this or in a conceptualization like this is play with this incidence term, i.e. If the sun was less bright in the past, you change the amount of radiation which you can hold in on it by having a stronger greenhouse in the past, you can maintain a reasonably constant climate, a reasonably constant range in temperatures. So what this is suggesting is that back in the Earth's earlier history, there must have been a much more vigorous greenhouse than there is in the modern day. A much more vigorous greenhouse. Uh, this is sort of consistent with what we think about how volatiles might have been outgassing from the mantle uh, over time. So this is just a, a model um, where uh, this would be the early Earth and this would be the present day on this time scale. 
And the amount of outgassing or CO2 in these tanks that we're looking at, so specifically carbon dioxide, is thought to have been perhaps three orders of magnitude at least more than the present day in the early part of Earth's history. Something that would have gone a considerable way to counteracting the, uh, the fainter sun. Okay, so this greenhouse effect goes a long way. In fact, if we didn't have the greenhouse effect in the modern, uh, on the modern planets, we would be 33 degrees cooler than we, than we are. So where does all this CO2 or where do the greenhouse gases come from? Well, they of course come from the solid Earth. They continue being released from the solid Earth through uh, volcanoes. But not only volcanoes that we can see, uh, very significantly volcanoes which are uh, which are um, under the oceans and mid ocean ridges. So the key thing that I want you to see on this diagram is the opening of the Atlantic. So this is a reconstruction of plate tectonics over time. And you can see Africa spreading apart from South America and the opening of the Atlantic. And that opening of the Atlantic under the sea must have been associated with a substantial amount of degassing. But of course, if you think about plate tectonics on a broader scale, plate tectonics isn't just constant through time. Presumably, the periods where you have a large amount of plate tectonic activity, large amounts of spreading, or a large amounts of mountain building, and there are periods when perhaps the Earth was slightly more quiescent in terms of its tectonics and it wasn't. Uh, uh, but were the same number of uh, tectonic collisions or the same amount of spreading. It's not just going to be a continuing linear thing through time. And I think, to at least the first order, we have a record of how active tectonics have been over time. This record is the strontium isotope record. The strontium isotopes are a radiogenic isotope system, meaning that in this case we're looking at the ratio of strontium 87, which is produced by the decay of another element into strontium 87, normalized to a stable isotope, strontium 86. And it just so turns out, for reasons that we don't need to worry about here, that the continents have got a high 87 86 ratio, whereas basalt or mid ocean ridges, things which are going on under the sea, oceanic crust, is sort of low. 87 86 ratio. And so I think in the first order, you might interpret a, uh, uh, a graph like this, which is over the last 500, 550 million years worth of Earth's history. This is the present day here, going all the way back to 550 million years ago. I think you would interpret this really rather wonderful record as in the first order being a record of inputs from the mantle or inputs from mid ocean ridges, a larger amount of mid ocean ridge spreading, giving rise to sort of low periods on the strontium isotope curve, and high periods being periods of greater continental inputs, and anything in between, some trade off between these two things. The most sort of famous example of this is the last few tens of million years, uh, where there's a very rapid rise in the strontium isotope composition. Uh, as recorded uh, on this curve, which is thought to be associated with the collision of India into Asia and the rise of the Himalayan uh, mountain belt. Is it, uh, is it too simplistic to say that when the point is high, there's more activity, and the point is low, there's less activity? Yeah, it, it is too simplistic because there are two types of activity. I think what, what it's telling us that when it's high, is that we've got a supply from the continents. When it's low, we've got a supply from the mantle, which in this case I'm inferring to be associated with mid ocean ridges, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Okay. Or what's being measured? Um, so this is strontium isotope ratios measured in marine carbons. Right. So this is a seawater record of strontium isotopes. So I didn't mention that. This is, this is meant to be a record of, of seawater. Uh, I think it probably is um, pretty faithful of, of seawater. Now, the, the point I was wanting to make with this is that I think what it's telling us is that tectonics isn't just happening at a constant rate, it's changing. 
right? There's some sort of oscillation between things happening on the planet. And so I think any kind of feedback that wants to maintain climate within a reasonably narrow window needs to deal with two things, two major things. It needs to deal with the change in solar luminosity over time, the increase in solar luminosity, which is the balance that, which is changing on really a very long time scale. It's 30% change, I think, in the solar constant over the entire Earth's history. And then something changing on a time scale of the order of 50 to 100 million years, which is tectonics. But both things changing on slow time scales, but tectonics changing on a more rapid time scale than solar luminosity. Tectonics is driving degassing. Solar luminosity is the amount of external radiation received to the Earth. Those two things together need to come together to maintain climate within a narrow window. Yes, question. <laughs> Why are you limited only to half a billion? Ah, well, I could have that slide out actually. So I could have extended it back. We have data over the whole of Earth's or much of Earth's history, but the data is a complete mess. <laughs> it's much more complicated to interpret for all sorts of reasons. Probably it's not recording the seawater very nicely anymore. There's a, a, an awful lot of effort that goes into selecting specific samples that we think probably do a decent job of recording seawater. As opposed to samples that have been completely recrystallized by something else. This is, I can't remember how many data points make up this diagram, but it, it's of the order of a, a, a few thousand, I think, in all this diagram. It depends on where you do the probe, uh, or it depends on the nature of the problem. Or what is the time? Mm, well, yes. do you include that? No, not really. Not <laughs> so, in the What's limiting it is how well preserved the samples are. So, what you've got to imagine is if you take a marine carbonate, a modern marine carbonate, it's a natural coral living in the modern day, it crystallizes out of modern seawater and it sort of gets buried. We make an assumption that that is going to have that modern seawater chemistry is going to leave some fingerprint in the calcium carbonate that has made up that coral. But that assumes that nothing had happened to that coral over the millions of years that it might have taken for us to come and discover that coral and sample it. But of course, that's just not true. That coral is not just going to sit there. And that ocean basin is going to become uplifted, it's going to become in place somewhere else, it's going to be recrystallized. And in doing so, that may well completely overprint any chemical signature that we're interested in getting. So every sample is often really well scrutinized. So the further back in time you go, the bigger a problem that becomes um, essential. There's another question. Yeah. Um, so uh, you've you've talked about how the solar luminosity changes over time, and that's one term. Yeah. And you've now talked about how the source of the greenhouse gases changes. Correct. But then there's also the sink. Um, how do you, is there any way to know how that changes or whether that changes, or is that also just known to be constant? The sink must follow the source to a certain extent, mm. in that over some time scale, we must reach some sort of steady state, and that steady state will always be determined by inputs, and the output must yep. somehow respond to that. If yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I will talk a little bit about it, but I won't address that question directly. It's okay. a rather interesting, rather interesting question there. Okay. Um, no, I can't remember at all what I was supposed to say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> talk about that. So climate. All, all I've said so far on climate is that we've been between 100 and, and, uh, and zero degrees. That's really not very precise at all. Uh, uh, there are much more sophisticated ways of trying to get at the temperature over time. That would be an entire lecture in itself, and I obviously can't do it. I just want to try and point out uh, this particular data set. This is another way of looking at oxygen isotopes, or well, not oxygen isotopes, oxygen and carbon isotopes collectively in calcium carbonate. And it's a way of trying to extract temperature from marine carbonates over time if those carbonates have been well preserved. And the punchline to this slide, which is what I'm going to cut straight to, is that um, we've got temperature on the y axis here, we've got time on the x axis, 
This is 500 million years ago. Uh, this is the present day. Assuming this data is correct, and assuming the interpretation of the data is correct, then both probably close in the first order, you would narrow down global temperature to within a much narrow, narrow, narrower window than 100 degrees. It's probably not changed beyond a few tens of degrees over the last five hundred million years. Now, I can't really talk about why, that is how we know that, so it would take forever. We just have to take that, uh, accept that for now. <laughs> so we must, if, if we're going to maintain temperatures within a few tens of degrees though, it means that we must have something, uh, some sort of a feedback mechanism that is stopping greenhouse gases accumulating very significantly in the atmosphere, prevents them from accumulating, but likewise prevents them from becoming too depleted in the atmosphere, otherwise we'd be Cold. So we must have a feedback mechanism in place. And the traditional view uh, of that feedback mechanism is that it is the silicate weathering thermostat. So all that was really a very long-winded expert, long-winded sort of background as to why we need a thermostat in the first place. So what is the thermostat? Well, the idea of the thermostat is that if you've got a greenhouse gas carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, that carbon dioxide will dissolve in water, and when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, we make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, and it will dissociate very straightforwardly, very rapidly into protons, and into the bicarbonate ion. Those protons are then available for hydrolysis reactions, dissolution reactions of minerals. So you take that atmospheric carbon dioxide, you take water that you have available on the planet, because we're within a temperature range where there's always liquid water, and we take abundant silicate minerals that we have on the surface of the planet, such as this stylistic silicate mineral that we use right down here, calcium silicate. Take that calcium silicate mineral, dissolve it in carbonic acid, you'll dissolve that, uh, that silicate mineral, you'll liberate the calcium 2 plus ions. Uh, you will deliver bicarbonate into solution where, as written, this reaction, all of that bicarbonate has been derived from the atmosphere. That is all coming out of the atmosphere. So, that dissolution reaction, what it's telling you schematically is that the per mole of calcium is released from a mineral, or per mole of any two plus ion that is released from a mineral, you will consume two moles of atmospheric carbon because you make two bicarbonates. You also deliver some silica into solution as silicic acid, which is available for other chemical processes. And that's in, in a very generic way, it's that reaction that's driving this uh, this dissolution profile that we can see in our Columbia river basalt. That's exactly what it is, the leaching profile where we have lost elements through dissolution. In that, uh, in that profile. It's exactly the same process that is happening on, uh, on Mars in this region up here. We are leaching things, presumably in the presence of a weak acid, not necessarily not of an acid, but in the presence of a weak acid. Uh, and you can look at this on a variety of different length scales, from uh, a continental scale to a uh, soil developing on top of a lava flow to what is referred to as a core stone here, also in the igneous type of rock where this is the actual original pristine rock which is present in the middle and everything around it are zones which have been leached out sequentially and you've lost, uh, you've lost elements into solution. All the way down to the microscale, where you can image an individual mineral lattice. This is a particular mineral called biotite. Uh, these are um, uh, Images where I think this scale bar up here is 30 microns, and this is a map of iron 2 to iron 3. And these red colors in here show the observation of iron 3 during the very early stages of dissolution of this particular mineral. So, dissolution is acting over a variety of different plates here. Uh, and it's leaving behind a sort of a residue on land in rocks, but it's also delivering ions into solution. This is why, of course, every bottle of mineral water has got a composition, a fixed chemical, a given chemical composition. All of the calcium that is present in our buxton mineral water, alternative uh, manufacturers of mineral water are, of course, available. Um, 
all of the calcium, all of the bicarbonates, have come directly from these kind of dissolution reactions that we're talking about. If we didn't have those kind of dissolution reactions, we wouldn't have any ions dissolved in the mineral water. It's a straightforward, you can imagine it in a straightforward way as that. But you must close the cycle and you must have to actually store that carbon dioxide permanently. You must do something with it, you must put it somewhere. And where you put it is in the oceans, you precipitate calcium carbonate in the oceans. If my equation is slightly cut off by that bit of uh, zoom down there, uh, but this says calcium carbonate, CaCO3, uh, 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 plus carbon dioxide, plus uh, silicon dioxide, which you can view as being a mineral quartz, um, uh, and water. So what you do is you take a silicate rock and long term, you turn it into a carbonate rock by a series of intermediate stages. And of course on Earth, where that's happening is that, that reaction is entirely bio-mediated effectively. Um, so this is uh, um, uh, lagoons in Florida Keys, but most of the calcium carbonate that is forming in the modern oceans is, is biogenic. Yes. So if you go back one slide, it yeah. looks like you got, so it's two moles of carbon yes. for every mole of CA2 plus. Correct. But then you restore some of that carbon in this part, but not all of it. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 So how does that all? Well, so in terms of the, in terms of the, this then depends on what time scale you're interested in viewing okay. this reaction over. And the purposes of this talk, where we're interested in very long time scales, for every mole of calcium deli delivered through dissolution of a silicate mineral, you would store one mole of okay. carbon in calcium carbonate and you would return one mole to the atmosphere. Yeah. So you'd have a one-for-one -one efficiency. Yeah. So per two plus ion delivered into solution, you can store one mole of carbon. Okay. If you're interested in shorter time scales, which I happen to be, I argue that that you would get two moles on a okay. short time scale. But no, it's not really relevant for today. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, good question. Uh, so the limestone, yeah, we've had you know abundant limestone that's accumulated over the plants. And presumably all of this limestone wasn't there at the outset, right? I showed that picture of the um, the, the moon forming impact right at the beginning. Presumably at that time on the planet there was no calcium carbonate. All of the calcium carbonate that large parts of the planetary surface surface geologically are coming in there must have formed over. The last few hundred million years, and much of it gets recycled throughout the geological record. It doesn't all just stay there, some of it goes down to subduction zones or gets um, cooked effectively uh, in subduction zones. But so, that collectively, these two reactions together the dissolution reaction and the calcium carbonate reaction this is what is referred to as the silicate mercury thermostat. So, why is it a thermostat? Uh, what makes it a thermostat? It must be somehow sensitive to temperature. And most parameterizations of this silicate mercury reaction, coupled with silicate mercury reaction, carbonate precipitate precipitation reaction, looks something like this, where there is a sensitivity to temperature, some sort of active an exponential term uh, with an uh, activation energy one over temperature minus one over temperature. Meaning that as temperature increases, that reaction will go faster. So this would be viewed for the dissolution reaction specifically. So as temperature increases, dissolution will increase. As dissolution increases, that's going to draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. As you draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, that's going to cool things down. As you cool things down, the dissolution reaction would slow down. That's why it's a thermostat. Right? That's the whole point of it. But you can't have that thermostat if you don't deliver material into the weathering zone to a place where it can dissolve. You must supply material to be dissolved. If you just had a planet with no tectonics and just had a, a, a no topography, no erosion, you would just develop extremely thick soils. We do on certain parts of the planet develop very thick soils up to 30 meters thick, very little weathering happening at all. 
you need erosion, typically modeled as being raised to some sort of a, a, a power. So you need supply material through erosion. So tectonics are supply material through erosion. You also can't have dissolution if you haven't got any water in the equation. So you need large amounts of runoff. Now, of course, runoff is going to be coupled to erosion. Runoff is going to drive erosion, physical erosion. But it's also going to drive dissolution. And so there are different ways of sort of viewing this. But essentially, weathering rate is proportional to, to erosion rate to some power and runoff rate to some power times an exponential dependency on temperature. And most views, most people tend to look at this temperature term as being the thermostat part of this reaction. I think that would be the standard way of viewing this is that there's the thermostat. <laughs> uh, and so it's really very simple, it's a bit complicated about that at all. <laughs> Can I ask something here? Yeah, but you need to have a cover in this. Ah, yes. There is one. So I can find it relevant, or I mean, there's yeah, so the absolutely. <laughs> The amount of calcium stored in life is irrelevant, yes, but can I come back to that? Okay. Because it's a really critical part of the whole, of the whole thing. And so I just stole this figure from a, a, a summary paper, a very nice uh, summary paper from this journal Elements, which is incredibly readable for, for non specialists. And um, uh, where, you know, this is looking at the, the amount of starlight on the planet relative to. Um, sunlight on Earth, so the, it's the amount of solar luminosity where we're given the planet uh, versus the planetary temperature. Earth is somewhere here, Mars is here, and this is what this particular author is estimating as a conservative habitable zone, i.e., it's an absolute minimum you can have living water present on the planet. And this is what this feedback, this silicate liquid feedback, is supposed to be kicking in, doing, is maintaining that zone as a habitable zone. So we've got any evidence for this control on the silicate river uh, uh, or controls of silicate in terms of erosion, runoff, and temperature. Well, first off, let's look at the erosion thing. This is um, uh, this is erosion rate on the x-axis down here, the amount, the mass of material supplied through erosion versus the amount of carbon dioxide consumed. And you know, it's on a lot of long scale, there's a reasonable trend between these two things. This is some of some the early evidence, or early ish evidence for our understanding of how the silicate weather and feedback works. So, the supply of water is uh, on the x axis again, which I think cuts off because of zooming. This is the amount of water that's being supplied versus the amount of CO2 consumed. And you know, there's some sort of a relationship between these, these two things. That's what this parameterization is largely based on. It's based on something like this. And if you look at temperature, then uh, temperature on the x axis in this case, and uh, effectively the amount of carbon dioxide being consumed on the y axis, there's a decent ish correlation. But the particular author that wrote this put all of these points in grey. The reason they put all of those points in grey is they view those points as being, yes, as a temperature dependency overall, but those points have got supply limitation. They're not supplying enough material to be weathering. There's not enough erosion in those places to allow weathering to happen in any appreciable amount. Although it's hot, if you haven't got the reactants there, you can't have your chemical reaction. The spoon in the coffee is just to remind you that the reaction is happening faster when the coffee is hot, the sugar dissolves faster when the coffee is hot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Um, can you actually figure out what? What the activation energy is. Yes, you can. This plot. Yeah, and yeah. And what is it about? Uh, I don't know, people would know better around 80. Okay. In whatever units that is in. 80 <laughs> Kelvins or. I really wouldn't know the units. Oh, kilojoules per mole. So there are, there's a lot of work on that station. Cool. Is that right? The glasses. Yeah, interesting. So obviously the papers on, on the weathering side will usually put a range, but I think that's more of a sort of number of lower bound, I think is where that's going to come to be two from a process point of view. And so this is sort of like the concept that there must be a limitation on 
from weathering in terms of the feedback. And this is a, a very complicated but colourful diagram. What it's showing you is the erosion rate here uh, against runoff. And they're saying what this diagram is trying to tell us is that there's only going to be a strong feedback when you've got a high erosion rate. You've got the same thing over here erosion rate against temperature. There's only going to be a strong feedback when you've got a high erosion rate. If you haven't got the material there, you can't have a strong feedback. So tectonics must be part of the feedback. Disentangling these three terms is important. So that's sort of one way of viewing the world, but there are other ways of viewing the world as well. And this comes from an interesting set of observations um, uh, looking at the concentration of solids in rivers against uh, the amount of water flow in the river. And from many, many catchments across the US, just because they have a good database of uh, water chemistry in the US. And so on these particular graphs on a log scale, we're looking at discharge of all of the x axes. Each plot is for a different river, but there are hundreds of different rivers that we could have taken against concentration of the y-axis of three different elements, silicon, calcium, and so on. The point that they're making in these graphs is that almost all of the slopes of the data are really quite flat. This is quite a surprise for many people, at least it was a surprise at the time the data came out, because essentially what's being argued here is, well, if it rains a lot, what you're expecting, imagine it being raining in Cambridge, just like it rained yesterday afternoon as I was cycling to go to the school room. <laughs> what you're expecting to happen is if you go and take a sample of water from the River Cam, you're expecting that rainwater to dilute any solids that you've got in the cap. So it's pouring in the rain, you double the volume of water in the can. Intuitively, there's not really very many solids in rain, you would intuitively sort of expect concentration elements to half in the river. And of course, that's this graph, these series of graphs are telling you that that absolutely does not happen. The concentrations in the river vary maybe by another, maybe by about a factor of five, something like a factor of five. It's a long scale in these graphs from the river. The amount of water in the river is varying by two orders of magnitude. Three orders of magnitude in some parts. And so something else is there. And you could view this in many different ways. You could view this as a dissolution reactions happen so very rapidly that very rain this dissolution can just keep up. Well, yeah, I think that's probably reasonable for my sugar on my teaspoon view, but I don't think that's a reasonable thing for a silicate mineral, otherwise the whole planet would just dissolve. That clearly cannot um, happen. Uh, perhaps there's water that is stored somewhere, or perhaps there's something else that's going on in terms of the control. And this set of observations has led to a sort of a whole different way of really trying to conceptualize the silicate river feedback in terms of instead of a dissolution control, but an equilibrium control, whereby what's controlling this is actually really a, a, a fundamental thermodynamic limitation of concentrated waters can become, because once a water becomes concentrated beyond a given amount, it will just start to precipitate things from it. You precipitate solids from it. You become supersaturated, you precipitate solids, and so you just can't dissolve anymore. You can have no net dissolution. You become limited by the amount of water that is present in your system. And people have tried to parameterize this in sort of various complicated ways. In this case, this is a, what's referred to as a reactive transport model, where we're looking at runoff, the amount of water in the system, and the amount of dissolved silicon solution. And then parameterizing this, suggesting that the sort of levels are in different ways, uh, depending on the equilibrium that we want to allow. If this was the case, it would sort of argue that the way the silicate weather and feedback works is in a slightly different way. If water is what's limiting the total amount of dissolution that can happen, well, that's still linked to temperature because temperature is controlling the hydrological cycle. So there's still a link to temperature, the temperature dependence on it, but it's not happening necessarily through the Arrhenius term uh, in this dissolution equation. So, really, there are two opposing views of how the silicate feedback might work. Not, not resolved 
uh, this is how long it puts it. And that leads me on really to a kind of easy answer to number of things, actually. So, yes, in terms of that saturation limit, that thermodynamic limit, of course, what that leads to is the precipitation of a whole load of other minerals. When I pointed out this earlier on, I said that this was just a product of dissolution, that this was a product of leaching. I have to say, I apologize, but I lied to you at the time. What this is, is actually a precipitation, a series of other minerals which have been precipitated from solution. And those of you spotted this carefully, or like this little band around here, which is a different thing. This is a sequential band of minerals which are which have come out of solution. Let's skip back because we have time. Life. So the rest about life. Now, obviously, life completely shapes our planet. That's what our planet is. That's what makes our planet different to every other planet. Because life drives weather. The most simplistic way of looking at this is that if we imagine our amount of carbonic acid which we have available as being uh, uh, as coming from the atmosphere, actually the amount of carbonic the amount of carbonic acid that is available in soils for dissolution far outweighs the amount of carbonic acid that we could ever get from just dissolving carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in rainwater. It's all happening in a soil environment where we have effectively the degradation of organic matter, which vastly ramps up the carbonic acid concentration or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the soil, which becomes dissolved in the soil environment. That's where it's all coming from. It's life that is completely driving everything. If you didn't have life driving the amount of carbonic acid available, the, the number of protons available would simply be far. Fewer. So life, at least in our modern system, plays a fundamental role to, to everything. But it also uh, plays a fundamental role in shifting carbon around, quite an interesting role, quite a controversial role in shifting carbon around. So you can view the organic, you can view photosynthesis and respiration for chemical reactions, which were all talked about in, I don't know, probably year seven or year eight of school or something like that. Compute those reactions on different time scales organic carbon burying or uh, organic carbon oxidation from the geological record. So, rocks which contain large amounts of organic carbon being brought up to the surface and re oxidized and delivering carbon back to the ocean atmosphere system, or likewise the modern the burial of recent organic carbon where the carbon has been taken out of the atmosphere. But when people try to look at this in the modern system, try and Think about what the budgets of these things are, the numbers are quite frightening. So this is just a link between the total amount of erosion and the amount of organic carbon from the modern biosphere. So when there are large amounts of erosion, there are very large amounts of organic carbon buried from the modern biosphere. But the more worrying thing is when people start to put together budgets um, for, uh, for entire catchments as to what's actually where the carbon is actually being cycled and where it's being moved around. There's a lot on this side of the but all I want to point out is the green bars, which are the amount of organic carbon burial, relative to the blue bars, which are the amount of carbon being shifted around by silicate weathering. And in just about all of these catchments you can see, or in many of these catchments, you see the organic side is outweighing the silicate weather side, which is a slightly worrying thing. How can you measure that? I mean, why are you shooting? I'm not sure about it. <laughs> um, first point is we only have this data for a handful of catchments, not very many at all. Uh, and it's measured by looking in quite a lot of detail about the cells. So be a very long time to explain that in detail. I just want to sort of flash this up as a warning sign, essentially. There's another warning sign on this diagram, uh, and that other warning sign is this thing called sulfide oxidation. Now, so far, we've assumed that dissolution only ever takes place with, in the presence of carbonic acid. We derive our protons for dissolution from carbonic acid. Of course, there are other sources of protons in our 
for dissolution reactions. So an important one is the dissolution of uh, an oxidation of this mineral here, which is called pyrite or fool's gold. And when that mineral oxidizes, it generates sort of purines, which is available for those or which uh, sort of purine acid obviously dissociates. Persolvate ion will give you two protons, so it's capable of dissolving uh, minerals. And if you take sulfuric acid and combine it with calcium carbonate minerals, which have already precipitated on the planet, then you will, of course, liberate the carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And if you go back to the same diagram, we've got uh, sulfide oxidation. Uh, on here in dark blue, we only have this in a handful of catchments. You can see it's releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So we're on the right of this plot, we're releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and we don't get consumed. But in a handful of catchments, you can see the carbon dioxide being released. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. This is some work done by people here. This is Emily Stevenson's work. You can't be here today, but she's actually sitting here in COVID as a photo of the day. She's done this for a, a large number of catchments, or one catchment over a large number of years in Greenland. She's done this calculation for. And the take home message is very simple CO2 release, as shown by the yellow bars, is far outweighing CO2 consumption in the blue bars in every single year since 1997. It's quite a striking conclusion compared to the, to the traditional. We've been trying to do this ourselves, trying to close this carbon budget in a region of Southeast Asia, which was predicted to be a hotspot of carbon consumption through silicate weathering. And really, to... <laughs> <laughs> really what I wanted to do was, was, was point out that it's a colossal effort to try to do this. When I asked the question earlier on how do you work these things out? It's a vast amount of effort. To give you a sense of how objective it is to just do it with silicate whether it's or pure it weather inside. This is one basin. This is the data set that goes in to one basin. The whole point of this figure is that you can't see what it is. There are 410 graphs on this figure that supply the data to be able to do this at a basin scale to try and nail the carbon budget. If we zoom in a little bit onto this, we we'll maybe start to see something. Each column on here is an individual tributary supplying the river, and then each individual plot has a different parameter. Here is the concentration of suspended sediment, the concentration of calcium ions, in this case, chloride ions, etc. But we need to know the concentration of each individual element. And we need it on a time series data. So this data is uh, monthly, for example. You have each month of the year over multiple years, which is what we need to be able to come up with any kind of robust budget. It's not a trivial, it's not a trivial thing. When you do this in these large rivers in Southeast Asia, it should just play quietly by itself. Slowly but surely, this should just change color. When it goes red, you have carbon dioxide release from these catchments, and when it goes green, you have carbon dioxide consumption. Now, this is a, a work in progress at this stage. But the preliminary results from this work in progress suggest that over these three continental style uh, sized catchments, that the overall carbon budget through silicate and carbonate where it works out that neutral and not consuming large amounts of carbon dioxide. So I'm just giving you this great long talk that ends up concluding that we're not consuming large amounts of carbon dioxide through some of the women. I apologize for making them sick at the this time. <laughs> but then, so there must be a solution. Has to be a solution, something else has to be going on. If this turns out to be correct, something else must be going on. And you know, there are various suggestions which are put forward, sort of whether in specific environments has become quite a popular one with the tectonics. But the other one that's completely unexplored, largely unexplored, goes back to this strontium isotope graph and what is drawing strontium isotopes down to lower values on this graph. And that is, of course, input from the mantle or input from the ocean ridges. And it's been uh, another point to make, of course, is if we want this feedback to work in one then life is clearly absolutely critical to this feedback. But life hasn't always existed on the planet. Feedback must have existed on the planet. So maybe what we're observing in modern rivers isn't necessarily representative of the entire planetary history. 
And of course, the other place where this feedback might just be sitting under our noses or sitting under the sea floor is the dissolution of mass energy in the sea floor. Like a thermal weathering, either on axis, on negotiated bridge axis, or off axis, supplying that unknown energetic sculpting into the oceans. And that is perhaps what we think that might be. Uh, and that opens up an enormous kind of worms to talk about. And that really is all I have to confuse you with. <laughs> okay. No questions, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it, I guess another idea of what could be the solution you kind of showed it would be very old, quite scary, but see what you thought of that. If you had a warmer wet climate, you drive more erosion, and that's key. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly, I mean, that's like what the whole biospheric community thinks, and what we want to think is really that it's the biosphere, the very recent organic carbon that was doing everything. And that's fine, that could be happening in the modern day. The question is then what happens pre carboniferous, pre development before there were plants? Or before there were large amounts of land plants on the planet. There must still have been some sort of climate feedback at that point. And it can't have been biospheric organic carbon that was still in the back then. So something else we must have been doing. Yeah, but there's also the point that the carbon isotope record suggests that the ratio of organic carbon to various carbonate area was to be about one to four over Earth history. Yeah, that's very true. Very Again, we can get into a very detailed discussion on that. Diagenesis is clearly a concern about that. Could you define diagenesis for people? Uh, so, I suppose the non preservation of an original signal. Okay. I guess it's pretty yes, I mean, that's, okay. that's the problem with modern, modern organic carbon areas, is they measure carbon in a certain big carriers of rivers. Most of that gets uh, oxidized by. Diagenesis of the ocean, so it's before it's permanent area. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Um, I was also thinking uh, along that way, I was thinking about how important is the subduction rate and how much of that carbon is being moved back into the crust, uh, like the rate of that river. Uh, <laughs> if you have any metaphor for it, you can increase that carbon back into the atmosphere. Yeah, so I think. Probably the easiest way to view that is, is to put it in the same pool as the mantle of degassing, to not distinguish the two things. So that outgassing turn from the uh, volcanoes or from the ocean bridges is part degassing from the solid earth and part of the recycling of carbon that was relatively recently on a geological time scale at the surface, which goes down as a friction zone to a certain extent and then comes back. Uh, and if you make exactly the same argument for metamorphic rocks in mountain belts where you bring all those carbonates or indeed bring uh, organic rich shales back up to the surface and either metamorphose the organic carbon into graphite in that case or oxidizing it and it escapes back as CO2. So I put a put them together. That's what I, did. I guess the key thing with the seagull weathering is that. There's, there's going to be like 100 million years or something between putting the carbonate into the sea floor and then devolatilizing the subduction zone. So you buy yourself out of today's greenhouse crisis and you just 100 million years later, someone else has to deal with it when it starts coming out of volcanoes. That's right. So a question, yeah. How much longer into the atmosphere would it be for the carbon dioxide? What's the difference between Earth and Mars? Is that a question? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, in terms of Mars history, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that directly. But I mean, what would, it, I mean, what would appear to happen is that at least in Mars, Mars's early history is that we were able to sustain water and then presumably it lost its greenhouse effect, became cold. 
someone else in the room well, I guess just one quick other interesting thing about that is that you can't get enough CO2 in Mars's atmosphere to keep the liquid water. So this kind of cycle by itself would be insufficient. We need something else like H2 or something to keep it warm. Any final questions? For you? And thank you everyone for coming on. It's fantastic to see so many departments represented um, in the 101s. Um, and so they're really doing their job in connecting across the, the community on these issues relevant to planetary habitability and the origin of life. And it's good that there are lots of exciting problems, both in making a habitable planet and then increasing the life as well. Um, so lots for us to think about going forward.